Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Horus Heresy Lord Breakdown. We are getting onto some really good books now very soon. Betrayer, Mark of Kalth, Vulcan Lives, The Unremembered Empire. These are pretty damn good books, and I remember enjoying them a great deal. And of course, Angel Exterminatus, the one coming up after this one. That has an absolute wealth of information pertaining to Petarabo. And I have actually already recorded that one because I had to go through it all whilst preparing for the Lord of Iron video. But we will continue to release it all in chronological order, so we are going to start now on Shadows of Treachery, one of the anthologies. Now this one has a total of seven stories in it, so I might divide this over the course of at least two weeks. We'll see, because there's quite a few of them. Let us start then with number one, John French's The Crimson Fist. One of my personal favourites amongst the short stories because it's nice and action-packed, and it gives us a beautiful look at the Imperial Fists and the Iron Warriors fighting. And these two arch enemies, oof, they make for wonderful opponents, they really do. Although the engagement itself is a little forced in uh, my opinion because it kinda comes out of nowhere. So. We all of course know about the fleet sent to Istvan to bring Horus to justice, the fleet that was massacred by the traitors. Well, Dawn has dispatched a second fleet, simultaneously roundabout, called the Retribution Fleet. He had wanted to lead it personally, but he was required to stay back and fortify Terra. Then he gave the mission to go to Sigismund, but he had a bit of a revelation at the hands of Euphrate Keeler, and he begged Dawn to send someone else, and so he did. Then the Retribution Fleet was caught up in the massive warp storms ravaging the Imperium, and only barely managed to make it out after having spotted a single calm place in the storms, the Foul System. Even then, when they arrived, they lost 200 warships. 200. 10,000 Imperial Fists gone. Just because of a storm. Ooh, my. <laughs> See, I feel like the warp storms are often underestimated in the Horus Heresy books, because in reality they are absolutely beyond devastating. It can absolutely wipe out entire fleets, yet there's not really much mention of it in the Horus Heresy, and I think it's because when you start talking numbers like 10,000 fists, uh, 200 warships, it makes the numbers feel kind of irrelevant, you know? There's always a, a danger when you throw out large numbers where you go like, oh my god, that's a massive loss, right? And then they turn out that, okay, well, then the Iron Warriors show up and the Imperial Fists fight them off. And in fact, during the course of this story, we'll de facto defeat them were it not for other circumstances. At which point you kind of go like, okay, so were those losses just not that important after all? It, it's the, um, what I like to call the death problem in many fictional settings and TV shows, etc. If you kill off a character in a very dramatic way or you uh, make grand losses, you know, they lose a battle, they lose, lose God only knows how many men. Uh, Game of Thrones is a key offender in this regard, by the way, and then you just kind of keep trucking along as if it wasn't really anything of consequence. It numbs the viewer, or in this case the listener and reader, in the case of audiobooks and books, to any further consequences, because they'll just kind of shrug and go like, okay, well, they lost X amount of dudes, and it doesn't really seem to affect anything, so... okay. What's next, basically? See, this is why I kind of like the other stories with the Raven Guard, for example, uh, desperately trying to rebuild their numbers, because it comes across as just that, a desperate attempt, a legion striving for survival, you know? Whereas the Imperial Fists never really get that same feeling. Anywho, Moving on, the Retribution fleet lost 200 warships and 10,000 fists, making it to the relative safety of the Foul system, leaving behind some 363 warships and 20,000 Imperial fists. 
Unfortunately, the commander of the Retribution fleet was killed in the transition, and so Command goes on to his protege, a young, relatively speaking, Imperial Fist captain by the name of Pollux. Now, Pollux is not a complete newbie to this, this isn't his first rodeo. He mentions that he has commanded expeditions and fleets before, and that he was the most skilled protege of the old commander, so he should have this well in hand, but he is nevertheless recently elevated to this position, and he has a great deal to prove to the rest of his commanders. He's also not in the best of shape at the moment, since he was, of course, on his master ship when it went boom, and he was just barely rescued one of, sadly, quite few to be salvaged from the wrecks of the vessels. You see, when a warship transitions from the immaterium to the material universe, that is a violent process at the best of times. It is the act of tearing a hole in reality through which a ship can pass. This gets exponentially more difficult the more vessels are transitioning at the same time and in the same type of general area. Y you can think of it like this. Um, dumping 10 vessels into an area of a thousand square kilometers is pretty goddamn easy. Dumping 500 vessels into that same area you know, the odds of them intersecting are still fairly small, but a hell of a lot larger than they used to be. And of course, the entire process of arriving in the spot you want to be is also determined by the warp. If you are in calm seas, you can come out with an error margin of, you know, 10, 20 square kilometers, which in astronomical terms is fucking nothing. It's as close to pinpoint as you're likely to be getting when you're transitioning from one dimension to the other. But when you are dumping the ships out of a warp storm, in all your likelihood you will be de facto blind as to where you appear, which, as you can imagine, is going to quite severely increase the rate of accidents. But Captain Pollux does not, however, believe that their arrival here was entirely accidental. In fact, he seems to believe that this is a little bit too good to be true in some ways. The Imperial Fist Relief Fleet all forced into a single system, the only spot of calm in a rolling warp storm the likes of which no one has ever seen. That does indeed seem a little bit too perfect, almost as if someone is trying to sequester them there. Nevertheless, I gotta say, it is an impressive leap of logic for Captain Pollux to figure out that this is indeed a trap. I imagine almost anyone else would have viewed this as a natural occurrence, a natural warp storm. Because remember again, at this point in time, no one would really ever be able to speculate that anyone would be able to use a warp storm in this way, in an offensive manner, to create a trap, especially not on this scale and this well controlled. But. Pollux has his suspicions and he is sticking to them. He has the entire fleet set up in a handcrafted defensive pattern to account for every possible eventuality, and he also makes all of the Imperial Fists run constant close quarters and boarding drills to prepare them for the arrival of the enemy he is convinced will eventually show up. But after weeks and weeks of no enemy appearing, Pollux's commands were beginning to be questioned by the other Imperial Fist officers. Yet he still stayed strong on his conviction, though he allowed for other ways of breaking out of the area. He allowed a Captain Tyre to try and find a way through the storm, utilizing small groups of ships. This caused the loss of another ten vessels and the damage of several more. And unfortunately, it did not grant any clues as to how to escape this apparent trap. Pollux also ordered the astropathic choirs to continuously attempt to find some way to communicate with the wider Imperium, with Terra, with anyone, frankly, but just like Tyre's attempts at escaping the storm, their efforts were also futile. 
Then, finally, when the entire fleet was rocked by what appeared to be a psychic attack, everyone thought that finally the enemy had arrived. But days later, and then weeks later, still no enemy appeared. It was only when secondary expeditions that had been ordered to map out the planets in system, all of which had been completely abandoned by any populace that may at some point have been there, that a pod was discovered. A small, life pod-esque like device studded with augers and sensors. But most noteworthy was the pod's occupant, a single astropath. This then was the source of the strange psychic attack upon the fleet, although undoubtedly there must have been hundreds if not thousands of identical pods scattered all across the system as some form of warning system, since Pollux now realised that the attack had been no attack at all. Instead, it had been a extremely powerful psychic signal, launched at the expense of all of the astropaths lives simultaneously to create a beacon strong enough to be interpreted and received even through the storm surrounding the Imperial Fist's fleet. And why would someone go to all the trouble of seeding some random area with Tons of auger pods capable of sending out such a signal. It would appear that Captain Pollock's suspicions have been proven resoundingly justified. At this point in the book, we also take a little bit of a detour away from Captain Pollux and the Foul System. First, we go back to Terra, where Rogal Dorn is just now informed of the slaughter of the Loyalist Legions on Istvan. The news, of course, comes as an absolute shock to everyone. Can you even imagine? You all of these loyal legions, not only have they been killed and the murder of a Primarch, something nobody even thought was possible, but several more legions have turned traitor simultaneously. It was a big enough shock when Horus and Fulgrim and Anglon turned, and now this. Ah, the, I love the way it's described too. The astropath that bears the message is almost physically broken by the message. She is crying as she delivers it. That is, it signifies the sheer physical and psychological shock of the event very well. Dawn then orders the chief astropath to burn out however many astropaths she needs. She must send a message to the retribution fleet. This is then not the fleet that was actually you know, sent to Istvan, this was the Imperial Fists fleet sent after them to order the fleet to return immediately. This will turn out to be a less than ideal order, but you can absolutely understand why Dawn would issue it, would you not? Then we head over to Petarabo. Petarabo is presenting a plan, an intelligence package that he has received directly from the War Master himself to his warsmiths. It is showing the foul system. It is showing 300 Imperial Fist vessels, their precise location and disposition, as if the War Master knew that this is where they would founder, this is where they would be found, and this is where he needed to place intelligence gathering devices. Many of the Warsmiths express disbelief at this. How could this even be possible? How could even the War Master know this? It seems too good to be true. Indeed, some of them even almost suggest, like, are we sure this is not a trap? I mean, this is way too convenient. But Petarabo has placed all of his faith in the War Master. As we know from later novels, he considers the War Master now to be the only honorable individual left in the galaxy. And, of course, this is the Imperial Fists. This is the Iron Warrior's most hated enemy, served up on a silver platter, 300 of them. 
Petorabo even knows that Dawn himself does not command the fleet, but instead he assumes the fleet is commanded by Sigismund, which it would have been were it not for the intervention of Euphrates Keeler. Hmm. Already we see the grand plans of chaos hitting a little bit of a road bump, apparently. It would seem that the powers that be had told the War Master that this fleet was commanded by Sigismund, suggesting that that would have been part of their original plan. Instead, as we know, it is not commanded by Sigismund at all, he remains on terror by Dawn's side. How much difference? Could the heresy have gone if Sigismund had died at Fau? Because, of course, Sigismund would probably have taken a very different approach to the Fau trap than Pollux did. Sigismund would probably have tried to break out and damn the costs, whereas Pollux took the exact opposite approach. Instead of trying to break out, he de facto hunkered down and braced for the trap he was ever so convinced was coming for him. Perhaps Pollux would have done the same, maybe, but I doubt it. Especially if he had been given Euphrates' uh, prophecy, but chosen to go anyway. In that case, he would have been desperate to go back to Dawn's side at any cost. He probably would have risked the entire fleet to do so. It is interesting, is it not? And then, of course, there's the conversation we get to see between Dawn and Sigismund. Why they didn't put this in one of the main books, I will never know, because this is a pretty goddamn major plot point, but... Oh well. Sigismund, after getting the news of the betrayal, finds Dawn standing in a plaza looking at the statues of his brother Primarchs, the traitors of course now having been covered by tarps. Sigismund then gets the urge, for some reason, I don't know, a guilty conscience perhaps, or the feeling that Dawn might understand if it was told to him now, but Sigismund decides that it is time to tell Dawn the truth, of why he requested to stay on Terra instead of taking a charge of the fleet that is now trapped at Fal. Dawn does not understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whilst reading this for the first time, I was kind of like, this ain't gonna work. <laughs> this... My buddy, my buddy, my dude Sigismund, this, this ain't gonna work. You are giving a passionate plea to Rokal Dawn. There's way too much emotion here. There's, there's far too much vulnerability, far too much insecurity, honestly. Dawn is going to hate this, and indeed he does, to the point where he outright denounces Sigismund and tells him that he is no longer worthy of being his son. However, Dawn will not remove Sigismund from his position. He will not kill him. He orders Dawn to continue as if nothing had happened, because Dawn is afraid that this crack in his legion's well, psychic armor, I suppose, will demoralize the rest of the Imperial Fists, and I think that is probably a understandable worry. Sigismund is held up like an exemplar of what it means to be an Imperial Fist, and if he can be convinced by some random girl prophet to the point of refusing his father's orders, and instead, you, you know, for the benefit of this prophecy, choose to stay on Terra, yeah, that would probably be a pretty damn major blow to the Legion as a whole. But I don't think that this cold calculation was the only reason why he went so far as to completely condemn Sigismund and renounce him de facto. Dawn had been worried for quite some time that he could not understand why Horus had turned and he had been worried that if he ever learned why Horus had gone traitor, perhaps the reason would make sense to him. To Dawn, in that moment, Sigismund became the personification of Dawn's fears, both about himself and about Horus. He saw his most favoured lieutenant, the man in his legion closest to himself, with a crack in his armour. 
with doubt, with vulnerability. And so Dorn chose to lash out and crush that vulnerability before he could fully recognize himself in it. It was as much a maneuver to protect himself as it was to protect the Legion, I think. But we have waited long enough, have we not? It's finally time to get to the Battle of Fal. The Iron Warriors had come in force, practically their entire legion, everything that Petrabo could get his hands on. He had explained to his warsmiths that it would not be enough to merely defeat the Imperial Fists, they had to be annihilated, they had to be humiliated, they had to be once and for all shown that the Iron Warriors were their superiors and therefore absolutely no expense could be spared. The Iron Warriors fleet massively outnumbered the Imperial Fists, and the plan was as simple as it was brutally effective. The Iron Warriors flotilla would form into one ginormous drillhead-like formation and hammer straight into the center of the more spherical Imperial Fists formation, aiming to shatter it from the inside out and then pick off the scattered elements that may remain. This was a bold, but also again brutally effective strategy. If it was carried out successfully, the core of the Imperial Fist Fleet would be hollowed out in mere moments. The battle would be over in a half an hour tops. However, Pollux had of course been preparing for a very long time. He had not quite been able to prepare for an attack of this scope, of this magnitude, of this sheer absurd size, but nevertheless, Every captain knew his duty, every ship knew its role, and every crew member had his task memorized to perfection. And so the Imperial Fists did not shatter, despite the overwhelming hammer blow of the Iron Warrior's fleet. And a little bit of a side note there as well, before this we have seen countless times loyalist legions being decimated because they cannot understand they are betrayed until it is far too late. They hesitate, they don't fire when they have the chance to do so, they refrain from resisting until the Balter Blasts are already burrowing through their chest plates. This was an advantage that the Iron Warriors took full use of at Istvan, but with the Imperial Fists it is different. It is possible that this is an aspect of them being fists, stubborn little fucks at the best of times, but I think honestly, the honour for why the Imperial Fists were able to immediately recognise the fact that they were up against an enemy force, and respond also with undiminished fury and no hesitation, is due to all of the training that Captain Pollux had put them through. The response to any enemy action that was so thoroughly ingrained within their brains and within their very spines at this point that they immediately reacted upon taking fire. They didn't stop to hesitate, oh hey, wait, that's the fourth legion, they're our friends, right? Oh god, they're shooting at us, panic, 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 no. The moment the first weapon was fired, every Imperial Fist ship began blazing back. But even so, things were looking mighty hairy for Dawn's Golden Boys. The Iron Warrior's fleet was much larger, and it had a perfect understanding of the Imperial Fist's position, their strategy, their disposition, and the locations of their valuable vessels. They had gathered all the information before the Imperial Fists even were aware that they were under attack due to the intricacies of the plan and the trap laid by Horus and undoubtedly his more immaterial allies. The Iron Warriors had every advantage, and it looked as if this would be exactly the humbling that Petarabo had been hoping for. Indeed, the Lord of Iron was stood on the deck, one of the hangar decks of his capital ship, looking out into the void. This is interesting because Petarabo was of the opinion that viewing ports on the spaceships were nothing more than vulnerabilities, 
After all, it's not like you could see anything in void combat. The nearest ship is likely tens of thousands of kilometers away. Even weapons fired is likely to be near imperceptible. It's not like being able to see the battle will help you in any way whatsoever. You need cold hard data for that. You need logical presentations. You need deployment maps. You need schedules. You need bombardment timetables. You need all of the myriad pieces of mathematics that makes up a war in the void. And yet even so, here stood Petarabo in a hangar deck with the void shields down in his full armor gazing out into the void. And who knows, perhaps the eyes of Primarch were able to discern something that mere mortals would not be capable of. Even so, of course, he couldn't see everything, and so he had with him one of his triarchs, one of his favoured adviser, Warsmith Barossus, to keep him abreast of the situation as it developed. And perhaps, perhaps, Petarabo could actually see the moment when the battle started turning in a strange direction. As mentioned, Captain Pollux had considered virtually every scenario, the only thing he had not accounted for was the sheer size of the enemy force. And indeed, if the Imperial Fist, as Pollux himself stated, had shattered in those few opening moments, perhaps his plans would have been for nothing. But they didn't break, and so his plans swiftly snapped into motion. The enemy formation was allowed deeper and deeper into the Imperial Fist's fleet. They were goaded in by nice, big, fat, valuable targets. Heavily armored battle barges aplenty, soaking up the Iron Warrior's damage whilst backing away from them. Maintaining as much range as possible, ensuring that they would take as little damage as possible, while still being perceived as offering the maximum amount of resistance possible. Whilst other areas of the Imperial Fist Sphere, the fleet began to turn in on the Iron Warriors, and began picking off small squadrons here and there. Slowly at first, but with mounting ferocity, groups of frigates and destroyers would swoop in and pick off a cruiser. A battle barge would streak through the Iron Warriors' outer formations, killing a capital ship. And slowly but surely, cruisers began exploding. Battle barges began disintegrating. Support elements found themselves overwhelmed by waves of torpedoes fired by frigates as they ran past at maximum burn. And the true genius of this strategy was that it was so very, very piecemeal, so very, very subtle. For every minute that passed, the Iron Warriors were doing less and less damage to the Imperial Fists, as their heavy capital ships again moved away from the main attack of the Iron Warriors. Meanwhile, the flanking and surrounding forces of Imperial Fists were slicing away larger and larger portions of the Iron Warrior's massed drill-like formation. If Petarabo himself had stayed in the Strategium to guide the battle directly, he may have noticed, well, he might have noticed immediately, but his urge to see the Imperial Fists humbled, and his urge to personally go and kill Sigismund, found him instead in a hangar bay, waiting to deploy. He even gave the incredibly hubristic order that Sigismund's ship was to be located, but not destroyed. Sigismund's vessel would be boarded, and his life would be Petarabo's to take, and only Petarabo's. A big, big mistake. Though, before we move on as well, I want to have just a little bit of a bitch and a whine here, real quick, okay? Void battles in 40k annoy me a great deal, because in one book, it is a long, slow, grinding, glacial affair. Munitions take minutes to reach a target, and void shields are massively powerful, capable of absorbing huge barrages of firepower and just keep ticking. This is the kind of combat I would personally prefer to see more of, because it's how I would imagine Void Combat actually would work out with these 
hilariously ginormous capital ships with unfathomable quantities of firepower and absurd amounts of defense. I mean, we're talking about vessels with kilometers of armor in some areas here. This would be a slugging match without equal, where the loser would be reduced to little more than a drifting wreck of twisted metal. I mean, just think of how difficult it would be to actually destroy such a gargantuan spaceship. I mean, you can blow kilometers of the vessel into space, and what's that gonna do? Vent some rooms here and there? Okay. Well, damage control bulkheads will immediately slam into place automatically. And now what have you done? You know, killed some crew, maybe? The, the bridge itself is undoubtedly inside of the ship's most heavily armored areas. They've got sub-bridges, command bridges. The prow of the vessel is so ridiculously heavily armored that burning through that is basically pointless. But other times, what in the void is a matter of just, oh, dead ship, oh, dead ship, oh, dead ship, oh, dead ship, and munitions apparently streak across the void in seconds. In this book, for example, they describe the opening moments of the fights. Like, so somehow also, the Iron Warriors just appear right on top of the Imperial Fists. Uh, this is not something you can do in regular warp travel. Appearing that close to a large formation of enemy ships within weapon range, oh my Jesus, would that be risky. Uh, granted, the Iron Warriors do have the guidance of, you know, the Im their immaterial allies, but I cannot imagine Petarabo taking that risk. Not even against the Imperial Fists, a force that he already pretty much assumed he had beaten. But they appear, instantly start firing, and boom, the first ship's dead. <laughs> okay, okay, again, come on here. And then they go on to talk as if, you know, dozens of ships have been wiped out in mere minutes. I'm like, how the hell? World War II fighter aircrafts <laughs> would apparently be tougher than this shit. Ah. Oh. Annoying, annoying, annoying. Anywho, that was my little ranto with Back to Foul. Captain Pollux had placed one of his primary strike forces under another captain by the name of Tyre. In all due reality, Tyre was a man of higher rank within the Legion than Pollux, but since Pollux was the protege of the previous fleet master, he was the one who ended up in command. Tyre had, um... Not been super happy with this, although he did refuse the position himself, but he was a man of more direct action than Pollux, and so the idea of simply sitting by passively and waiting had not sat very well with him. But Pollux had certainly been more than justified in his actions, and he had given Captain Tyre 50 vessels with which to plunge into the very heart of the Iron Warrior's formations. He had lost quite a few of them at this point on several successful attack runs straight through the Iron Warrior's fleet, but he had destroyed four times his number of losses. A pretty darn good tally, and make no mistake about it. And then he came across an extra-large Iron Warriors vessel, one he recognized immediately as the Iron Blood, Petrabo's personal flagship. He immediately voxed this information back to Pollux, expecting perhaps to be called off, expecting the fleet to withdraw, maybe, or avoid the Iron Blood, but... Quite the contrary, Pollux orders him that Tyre is to fulfill his orders. He is to strike at the heart of the Iron Warrior's fleet, and now that the presence of the Primarch has been confirmed, his orders are even more simple. Execute Petrabo. <laughs> this Pollux is really growing on me, I've got to say. Meanwhile, the Lord of Iron is, um, not happy. Not in the slightest, in fact. It's a little bit unclear whether or not he has retreated to his throne room now. It sounds as if he has, because it's mentioned that he is near the throne of Iron, and that he is staring at a tactical representation of the battle, but he is apparently still not giving out commands or orders directly. He seems to simply just be watching. Then Barossus appears again to give the Lord of Iron an update. Barossus is 
not happy with being the one to deliver these uh, unfortunate news, but he apparently has drawn the short straw on this particular occasion, and so must inform Petarabo that they have located the enemy's lead vessel, and they have also been able to identify who commands it. And it is, as we know, not Sigismund. He puts it as, it is a commander of the Lower Orders, a Captain Pollux. Now, he's right, he is a Captain of the Lower Orders, but if I had been him, I would probably have left out that particular piece of information, something that Barossa's probably thought about as well, as Petarabo smashes him not once, but twice, just to make sure that Barossa's was not going to be getting back up again. Ever. But is a wee bit testy, <laughs> it seems. And hey, I'm hardly surprised considering the current circumstances. But even then, after having de facto killed one of his triarchs, he simply returns to his throne without taking command over his fleet. Interesting, that. I suppose... I, su I suppose his reasoning is that if he was to take personal command, that wouldn't really be good enough. That would just be him, Petarabo, a Primarch, defeating a trapped foe in a trap that the Warmaster has prepared for him. Mm, that's... There's not real satisfaction in that. No real glory. No clear demonstration of the superiority of the Iron Warriors, so perhaps he decided to leave the matter of humbling the Golden Boys of Dawn to his warsmiths, assuming they would have no trouble. Unfortunate for him, I guess. But then, cruel fate intervenes to piss all over the Imperial Fist. Rogal Dorn's message breaks through the storm surrounding Fal, and it is a loud and clear one. Sons of Dawn return to terror. No room for interpretation there, sadly. The problem is, of course, that the Imperial Fist's fleet is now locked in battle with the Iron Warriors, to the point where disengaging is not really an option, or at the very least, not an option that is not going to come with um, crippling costs. Pollux considers his options, whether or not he should stay and try to win the battle, and it does indeed seem as if he is currently winning, though whether or not the Imperial Fist would have won the entire battle, I don't know. I, I don't think Petarava would have allowed for his Iron Warriors to be annihilated. I think he would probably have taken command previously, before that, excuse me, and disengaged the fleet rather than allowing them to be just destroyed. But nevertheless, it would in that case probably have ended as a very decisive Imperial Fist victory. But... Dawn's orders had been extraordinarily clear. Normally, of course, astropathic telecommunication is... Telecommunication? Telepathic communication, excuse me, is extraordinarily difficult to pass and actually, you know, impart any real meaning to it, but nope, not this time. Presumably for plot convenience reasons rather than a whole lot else, frankly. They talk about how powerful the signal is, but that doesn't actually matter. N not at all, really, because... Astropathic communication is not words at all. It's pictures, it's sound, it smells, it's um, iconography, it's symbology. This is why every single astropath has an entire uh, Bible, basically, containing all of the various symbols, all of the various clues, all of the various things that he uses to decipher a message. So, no. But again, you know, dramatic necessity, so you can't whinge too much about it. Pollux is then forced to decide whether or not to continue the battle to a probably successful end, or obey the orders of Rogal Dawn. Now, in this situation, I would say that the only correct response is to continue the battle. Even in the worst case scenario that Pollux imagines, you know, when the enemy is already at Terra's gates and they are the only ones that can actually do anything, what could you do? 
All right, you've got already a hammered Imperial Fist fleet, way beneath the strength when it actually headed out from Terra. And when you throw away another two, three hundred goddamn ships trying to escape, you're not going to have a force worthy of returning to Terra with. However, if you can destroy a much larger Iron Warriors force, you would of course be doing far more for the war effort. I suppose you could argue that, um, you know, it might be a situation of win the battle, lose the war, but <laughs> it's more of a question of lose the battle, lose the war. I mean, if the enemy is already on Terra, what possible help is Pollux's tiny, battered-ass fleet going to give, you know? And honestly, I would have expected the Imperial Fists, again a somewhat cold and calculating legion, for Pollux to figure that out, but at the same time, they are also disciplinarians extraordinaire, and disobeying orders is not really a thing they do. And that lack of immediate tactical flexibility is directly responsible for the losses that Pollux then endures as he orders the fleet to try to escape, with predictably catastrophic consequences. It also means that the boarding action launched against the Iron Blood is doomed to failure. A couple dozen Imperial Fists actually do manage to make it to Petarabo's throne room, and Petarabo simply throws open the doors for them, because he probably is, at the very least, somewhat admiring their effort of getting this far, of their tenacity, and wants to let them die like warriors, and <laughs> probably also because Petarabo is just fucking angry at this point. And he, of course, butchers all of them because well, he's a goddamn Primarch, and well, there's, what, I think 40 or 50 of them left? Yeah, that that's that's not going to get you very far against Petarabo, I'm afraid. So that's another 1,300 fists dead right there, as Tyre led a strike force of 53 Terminators and 1,300 fists, all of which were dead. Now, normally that was kind of expected, and a second wave would come in to stiffen up the force before it going in against Petarabo, but, you know, they're retreating, so that's not going to be an option. Captain Pollux attempts to shield the rest of the force as it withdraws piecemeal, and that would have worked perhaps in a situation where they are fighting against an enemy that were of equal size, and hell, I might even argue that he could have waited and at least cut down the Iron Warrior's numbers, but a path appears in the warp storm and they're like, oh god, you gotta hurry, otherwise it might close. Again, a dramatic convenience there, but you know, honestly, the thing that probably annoys me the most is previously, when the Iron Warriors fleet arrived, we were like, oh god, ships are blowing off left, right, and center immediately. Battle takes minutes in space. But now, all of a sudden, the retreat will apparently take a really long time and be really slow and give the Iron Warriors plenty of time to regroup and rally and go after them in force. Really? Like, the Imperial Fists have been trying to gain space between themselves and the Iron Warriors this entire time, and again, the Iron Warriors are already scattered. They are driving in one direction. Surely, if Pollux had simply ordered all of the ships to turn about and head out system, he probably would have been able to save a lot more, but... Not having a clear um, look of the battlefield, of course, means that it is just assumption, so again, I'm not going to complain too much, but... I do feel as if this ending was a bit forced, but again, it's a short story, you know, so uh, some sacrifices must be made. Uh, Pollux himself refuses to withdraw before the fleet is safe, leaving his vessel, the Tribune, as one of the last to flee, which of course, the Iron Warriors fall upon it immediately. A vessel by the name of Contrador, captained by one Golg, wants to seize the Tribune. They board it, they successfully do so, and then Pollux detonates the vessel, teleporting over to the Contrador in an effort to seize it, which they do just about manage. They will then use the Iron Warrior's vessel to escape the war zone, which does make me question, as the Iron Warriors apparently board several other ships afterwards in an act of supreme petulance, they board the ships, fight their way to the engine compartment, 
cripple the engines, then just leave to allow the lifeless husks to drift without life or power support and allow the um, soldiers aboard to simply just die eventually. Why didn't the rest of them detonate their engines? Now, of course, in actual 40k lore, um, it is possible to self-destruct a warship, obviously it is, but it requires a fair bit of effort and planning. It isn't something you can just do. Overloading a plasma reactor, in fact, is a pretty damn complicated and lengthy process. You need to remove a whole armada of safety mechanisms designed specifically to avoid that overload, and then you need to build up the power within the engine over a period of time without giving it any outlet. Again, it's just... Ah, but I'm getting into a little bit too much in the way of logistics now. At the end of the day, this is actually a pretty damn good story, and I really do enjoy it. It's just when you overanalyze it. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is that. To wrap it up, the Battle of Fal is now an Iron Warrior's victory. Although Petarabo sure as hell doesn't view it like that. He just, you know, withdraws back into his throne room and starts smashing every monitor he sees. That shows what probably would have happened if the Iron... Iron... If the Imperial Fists hadn't simply just turned around and escaped. I wonder how many times I've mistaken Iron Warriors for Imperial Fists over the course of this video. Half a dozen at least, I suspect. And Pollux... Aboard the captured Iron Warrior's vessel, delves into the warp, and then, eventually, after God knows only how long, he finds the beacon off the Astronomicon, and finally re-emerges to the light of terror. Except, of course, not. It's not terror, it's the beacon of the Pharos. It's McCrag. And that makes Pollux a very, very sad lad. In fact, even in the future, he will say how he absolutely regrets not defeating the Iron Warriors when he had the chance. And, oh, well, yes, I agree. But still, The Crimson Fist is a pretty damn good novel. For a short story, it's pretty solid. It's got a lot of action, it's got a lot of uh, information, it's got some interesting characters, and it has a sense of tragedy to it, which I really do like. It's just when you start overanalyzing it again, you know, it gets a little problematic, but it has a weight of like, ah, oh, shucks, you know? The Imperial Fists have to withdraw. It's the order of their Primarchs. They can't just ignore it. It's a clear order, etc., etc. And they describe the losses, the pain they suffer. And it's good. It's good. It really makes you sympathize with Pollux and his position. It's a really solid read. The next one, then, that we will be moving on to is, um, The Dark King by Graham McNeil. Until then, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.